Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you former Solicitor General of the United States, Ted Olson, who served in this role from 2001 to 2004 under President George W. Bush. From 1981 to 1984, during Ronald Reagan's presidency, Mr. Olson served as Assistant Attorney General. He also served as President Reagan's private counsel. In 2010, Time Magazine named Mr. Olson one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He is one of the nation's premier appellate and United States Supreme Court advocates. He's argued 65 cases in the Supreme Court and has prevailed in over 75% of those cases. These include the two Bush versus Gore cases arising out of the 2000 presidential election, and most recently, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security versus Regents of the University of California, challenging the recent cancellation of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. During the conversation, Mr. Olson discusses his recent Supreme Court cases and why he believes his conservative viewpoint has served him in representing these cases. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program, coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office, with Ted Olson and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director, John Highbush. Ted, just wonderful to have you with us. Uh, as you know, we love and admire you uh, here at the Reagan Foundation, not just because of your remarkable legal career that we've watched with fascination for years, but as you well know, because of your many years of service as a trustee uh, at the Reagan Foundation. So just a delight to have you, uh, Ted. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's a thrill for me. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate being a part of Ronald Reagan's legacy uh, and the foundation and the memories of Ronald Reagan and everything that the foundation does, which I am so impressed with. It's a wonderful board of directors, as you know. Everybody on this board is involved and cares uh, deeply about the mission of the foundation, and I'm, I'm very gratified to be a part of it. Oh, thanks, Ted. So let's, let me play off of the, your comment about our 40th president, Ted. Um, you uh, served our 40th president. However, I believe it was a unique role. You were his personal lawyer, uh, his counselor, uh, I think during the second term of uh, the Reagan presidency. Is that right? Well, I first met and started to work as a personal attorney for Ronald Reagan in the 70s before he was elected president. In fact, I was a part of his administration when he was governor of California. My partner, William French Smith, was a part of the Reagan kitchen cabinet uh, and a close advisor. And somewhere in the late mid, mid to late 70s, I started helping him out doing personal work for the Reagans, both President Reagan, uh, and then, then Citizen Reagan, uh, former Governor Reagan, and Mrs. Reagan, and then it carried into the first uh, Reagan administration, the first four years, when I served in the Department of Justice. And then after President Reagan left office, I worked personally for him in various capacities, including in connection with the Iran-Contra investigation. That's right, the Iran-Contra investigation. That's what I was um, thinking about uh, when the second term came to mind. But obviously then, Ted, you had known and, and worked for the Reagans, as you said, for years. Not a lot of people um, had that opportunity. Um, and I, I wonder, 
Can you give us your impressions of, of President Reagan, what he was like um, as, a, as a man, as a, as a leader? Uh, you obviously had to be impressed like so many others, but you got to work with him up close. So how would you describe the, the president? I could go on and on about Ronald Reagan. Um, I did prepare his blind trust when he became president um, and entered office. But I spent a lot of time with him before and since he took first took office. Ronald Reagan was a man of great, deep personal convictions that were very, very much associated with the principles that underlie uh, the, this nation, uh, the, the, the standards of this nation, the principles of this nation, the sense of individuals, uh, that individuals created this nat- nation with high moral principles and a commitment to liberty and individual freedom. Ronald Reagan was very much a part of that. He felt that government, he knew that government was created by the people for the people. It wasn't the people created the government to tell them what to do. He knew that people created a government and gave the government limited powers. But he also knew that government could be an impediment um, and that he felt that government that protected people and liberated people to do the best that they could on their own within their own community was a central part of the his core beliefs. Plus, he was a great, as everybody said, great communicator. He, because he had spent so much time before being president, going around and talking to people of this country uh, on factory floor, floor floors, uh, and other places throughout the country, he honed his own positions, his thoughtfulness about what this country stood for and what its principles were, and he knew how he expressed them. And he didn't have one of the reasons he had no trouble expressing them persuasively is that these were his convictions. No one else wrote his speeches. He wrote his own speeches prior to his presidency, and even after his presidency. Other people helped, but he was the ultimate author of those speeches. He was a very kind and gentle person. He really had great affection for people. He was always in his, when you were in his presence, he was looking for ways to make you feel comfortable. He did not want people to be overwhelmed by the fact that they were speaking to the president of the United States. There was great depth of kindness and compassion in Ronald Reagan. As I said, I could go on and on and on, but those char- personal characteristics were among the things that made him such a great leader. People understood that about him. They understood his sincerity. He, they understood that he was a real person speaking from his heart and, and talking to people uh, from his core convictions. Yeah, great. That's so wonderful to hear, Ted. I, You know, you must have been a counselor to the president when you were 10 years old because you sure don't, you sure don't, it's just amazing. You look great, Ted. Yeah, well, thank you for supplying um, the makeup artist that helped me today. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, I don't know if the number is accurate, um, and it's because you have appeared before the Supreme Court so often, but the number I read is that you have argued before the Supreme Court 65 times at last look, and have won 75% of those cases. Are those numbers accurate? The number 65 is accurate, and the number 75% is as close approximation as you can make. Sometimes Supreme Court decisions are a little ambiguous, but we've looked at that again and again, and it's somewhere between 75 and 80%, I'm I'm glad to say. Okay, so um, whether uh, you're modesty will uh, allow it or not, is, isn't is that, aren't you the most winningest of attorneys before the Supreme Court in the nation's history, or is someone else uh, ahead of you? Oh, no, I am not. Um, I have been fortunate enough in the last, I didn't start, uh, my first argument before the Supreme Court was when I was 43 or something years old. Many other people who've spent time in the Solicitor General's office for the government, uh, have argued more cases. Um, And um, I don't know whether anyone has a higher percentage of 
wins versus losses and so forth. I've never made that calculation. Another factor to take into consideration is that um, the Supreme Court has been hearing 65 approximately or 75 cases per year. This year it was only 57. About 30 years ago, it was 150 cases per year. And in the 30s, it was over 200 cases per year. So many lawyers and some of the earlier pioneers of advocates in the Supreme Court had many, many other arguments. The statistics are a little bit misleading uh, and not necessarily accurate. But it is, I'm just thrilled that I had one opportunity um, to argue in front of the Supreme Court. It's a great honor and a great pleasure. Um, and I'm satisfied, more than satisfied with the, that fact. Okay, so with having argued that many cases before the Supreme Court, this is a question maybe you've not gotten before, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Are you a superstitious fellow uh, in any sense in that you have some routine that you might follow, uh, you know, every each morning before you go before the highest court in the land? Or is there, you know, you wear a lucky sweater or is there anything at all that, you know, is part of your winning formula? Well, in the first place, I am superstitious to this extent that I believe that when you are doing something like that, when you have the opportunity to argue before the Supreme Court, there is no substitute and no excuse other than preparation. You have got to be prepared. You have got to be overprepared. And if you ever walk into the United States Supreme Court and haven't done your best to prepare for an argument in the Supreme Court, then shame on you. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. The court deserves it. The people that you represent deserves your best preparation. And it's always a team effort, John. It's always a number of people in my law firm, sometimes in other firms, um, sometimes from law schools and so forth. And you owe it to them to be prepared. Um, and so that's, I don't know whether you'd call that a superstition, but that is a mantra for me. You prepare, prepare, prepare. And yes, when you go into the Supreme Court, it's part of the culture of the Supreme Court uh, that you wear a certain outfit, like a dark suit and a modest tie and things like that. Uh, if you're a woman arguing in the Supreme Court, you want to avoid dangling jewelry or anything that can distract from your message. Uh, when you are in the, uh, a solicitor general, which is an office that I served for a number of times, the, the costume of the solicitor general in the Supreme Court is a morning suit. So it's long tails uh, and a vest and so forth. Um, uh, I also feel another superstition I might have when I'm done arguing a case in the Supreme Court, people ask me whether I've won or lost the case or I think that I've won or lost the case. I never try to predict what the justices of the Supreme Court are going to do. One other little thing in answer to your question is that when I argued the Bush versus Gore cases in the United States Supreme Court. My then wife, Barbara, before the first of that argument, when everyone was saying that we had no business in the Supreme Court, we were going to lose, she snuck in the middle of the night knowing which suit I was going to wear uh, and put a laminated um, card from the Catholic Church. It was St. Michael, um, St. Michael, the, the savior of lost causes or something like that, I think of St. Michael the Avenger. Uh, I'm not sure I have that accurate. But since I won those two cases in the Supreme Court, to the surprise of some people, um, and that that was such an important victory for many different reasons, I figure why take a chance? So I stick that same laminated card in the pocket of my suit every time I go to the Supreme Court again. So I have some feeling that not only my preparation and my team but St. Michael is working for me. Uh, perfect. I knew I would ferret some superstition out of you, Ted, on this. Uh, and uh, I thank you for re reminding me uh, about Barbara. I want, what a wonderful woman and uh, lucky guy you were to have spent the time that you did with her. Is there a constitutional right uh, that you have not argued uh, in favor of uh, in, during one of your 65 cases before the court? Because, it, you know, having read a number of uh, the headlines for these cases, Ted, uh, it just, your, your experience in terms of, of, of you know, pro, uh, arguing uh, in effect for 
so many different rights from uh, the Commerce Clause, jury rights, voting rights, separation of powers. Is there one that you've not actually uh, gone to court um, uh, in, in favor or uh, in favor of? Well, I suppose uh, that we could come up with one, but um, I think that just about everything that's in the Constitution I've had a chance to study. One of the great riches of my life, and I think I've been very, very fortunate uh, because of my colleagues and because of the opportunities that have been given to me, um, and luck has a lot to do with it, uh, is that we have had an opportunity to study the, the United States Constitution and understand how it works uh, and how it works for people and understand how the courts have interpreted the Constitution over the years. Um, and just about every part of the Constitution, I think there's a provision in the Constitution, maybe it's the Third Amendment to the Constitution, about quartering troops in your home. And I don't recall having a case involving quarter, quartering troops <laughs> in your home, John, or my home, or anybody else's home. But uh, yeah. just about everything else, um, there, 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 that, that in, including, most importantly, I think, the separation of powers, the pow the fact that the Constitution divides our government into three branches of government, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive branch. And of course, the president is the pinnacle of the executive branch. Um, that design, which was unique when it was created by the founders of our country, protects is designed to protect our liberty, to prevent power to be from being concentrated in any one individual or group of individuals so that Congress can pass laws, but they can't enforce them. The president can enforce laws, but he can't interpret them. He can't decide whether they're constitutional or not. And the judiciary can interpret the laws, but it can't pass laws and it can't enforce laws. So if the government is going to impose a burden on you as a citizen, all three branches of government have got to have decided that that burden is appropriate to be imp burden or penalty uh, to be imposed upon you. Um, that's a remarkable system of government. There still is no government in the world quite as accomplished as that government is, is to ensure liberty and ensure maximum freedom for individuals and to produce the kind of economy that has made us so successful. Okay, I'm going to ask... Uh... An unfair question. Uh, this is like asking a home run hitter, you know, what was their most important home run in their career? But um, is have you ever thought about Ted? And do you have, uh, of all of the 65 cases you've argued before the Supreme Court, is there one that you would define as being the most important for the nation? I, I want, might want to give you more than one answer to that question, John. Um, one of the first cases that comes to my mind in connection with that is our firm's uh, and our team's effort to overturn Proposition 8 in California, which denied the right of individuals, same-sex individuals, to marry the, the person that they loved. Uh, at the time we undertook that case, it was against the law almost all over the United States for loving people of the same sex to become a part of the community, to form a relationship and raise a family, uh, and to be a part of our society. We undertook that case, and it was a five-year case. We tried the case in federal court in San Francisco. We were in the Court of Appeals uh, in San Francisco, the Federal Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We were in the California Supreme Court, and we were in the United States Supreme Court. And at the end of that five-year odyssey, the Supreme Court overturned Proposition 8 in California and liberated tens of thousands of Californians to be happier in their life, to be freer, to be free of discrimination. And because that affected so many people and because it caused a cascade of changes throughout the country, now every, citizens in every state have the right uh, to marry someone of the same sex, someone that they love and to raise a family. Uh, so that's changed the United States, and in effect, it changed the world because other countries followed suit. Uh, I'm very proud of the work of all of the lawyers uh, that were involved in that as a part of that team. I'm also very proud and pleased about the decision of the Supreme Court this year. Uh, we defended 700,000 dreamers. 
uh, individuals who had been brought to this country, not of their own volition, maybe when they were one years old or two years old or five years old, and had been a, a part of our society for these many years, uh, had not violated any laws, had formed families, had served in the military, uh, had had children, um, and President Obama uh, enacted an executive order that permitted them to be deferred uh, in, in, the, in, in the immigration scale so that they didn't have the fear of being deported uh, to countries that they didn't know anything about and where they might not have even been able to speak the language. Um, and they could form jobs, they could take jobs, they could uh, support themselves rather than having the government support them. 700,000 families, plus the people in their communities and the uh, employers for whom they worked, were at peril. And we convinced the Supreme Court that although President Trump had every right to change that policy, to reverse the Obama policy, he had the freedom to do that, but he had to do it by the rules. He had to pay attention to the procedures. He had to explain why it was being done. And he had to explain under the Administrative Procedures Act the process by which it was done. Um, and we we prevailed in that case. And I was very gratified by, by that because I'd met many of these individuals. And I could imagine what it would be like if they'd lived in this country, come here when they were six months old, and then be forced to go to a country they didn't know or understand and be ripped away from their families. So I was very gratified by that. And then the third one, if, if you allow me that, um, are the two Bush versus Gore cases where the presidency was at stake. Uh, there was an effort by the Gore effort to, uh, the Gore team to change the rules down in Florida, to recount votes again and again and again, and to change the outcome of the election. And we prevailed in the United States Supreme Court. And as a result of that victory in the Supreme Court, George W. Bush took office as president and, and many other people who have counted those ballots again and again subsequently uh, came to the conclusion, including independent uh, an analysis uh, from newspapers, publishers, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, he, George Bush, won that election. But we have since preserved that victory for him by making sure that the rules could not be changed after the election. Yeah, okay, well said, well said, Ted. So... Your response to my last question uh, was about, um, you know, cases that you felt shook the nation, I mean, that were truly important in that regard. Now, let me ask you, is there a case that um, you would say you're most proud of winning? Now, it may well be one of the three you just cited. I just wonder if, was there a particularly difficult case that no one thought you could win and you did, or... One that you just, you know, took a real personal sense of achievement in winning. It might have been one of those three. I, I, I would certainly include those cases. Uh, there were other cases that we, I, I, we won a case just a couple of years ago that overturned the federal statute that prohibited states from regulating and licensing betting on sports. We lost that case four or five times in the federal district court. We lost it three times in the federal courts of appeals. Uh, and we kept after it. We, our client was Governor Christie, um, and we kept after that case with his support. We wound up in the Supreme Court. Everyone assumed that we were going to lose. The betting was against us, so to speak. Um, uh, and 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 we yet we prevailed in that case in the Supreme Court. It was a very difficult case. We we convinced the court that the federal government can regulate betting on sports if it wants to, but it can't force states to regulate and betting on sports. In other words, it was called a conscription doctrine um, that the federal government cannot compel states to do its bidding. It can do it itself. It can pay for it. It can take responsibility, but it can't shrug that burden off to the states. Oh, that was a, something that we we worked very, very hard on. But the other cases that I mentioned were all cases. In each one of those cases, I think that many of the so-called experts, um, law professors, uh, commentators, and so forth, were saying, well, you are go certainly going to lose that. In the Bush versus Gore cases, we were accused of committing professional malpractice by even attempting to bring the case to the Supreme Court. 
uh, and yet we prevailed. So, um, and again, all of those cases were team efforts. Uh, many, many other uh, lawyers in my firm, Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, and in some cases, people from other firms that joined us and helped out that. So it wasn't just me, um, it, uh, and it wasn't me. It was the, the court made those decisions, but I was very gratified, I still am, of presenting the court with the right, with the arguments that were persuasive and ultimately carried the day. Got it. Okay, how about your toughest loss? Is there one that stands out where you're like, we should have won that, and you sure wish you did. Well, there were a few cases like that. Um, uh, I've tr I've successfully rubbed most of those um, instances out of my memory. Um, the fact is, the fact is, I say that, um, and and lawyers like to talk about the cases that they've won rather than the cases that they've lost. But we've all lost cases that mean a lot, um, and whenever that happens. Um, you do remember it. You do, in fact, remember it probably more than the cases that you won. I lost a case in the Supreme Court this year where we were trying to convince the court that Congress had passed a the Puerto Rican Financial Oversight Board to deal with the immense bankruptcy in Puerto Rico involving billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, and many, many uh, individuals who are losing money and so forth. Uh, and Congress kept the appointment part of that the, that board to itself rather than allowing the president to appoint uh, with advice and consent of the Senate the leadership of that board. We thought that violated a fundamental part of the Constitution, the appointments clause of the Constitution. We won that in the Court of Appeals, but we couldn't convince the Supreme Court, so we lost that case. And you always wonder, what could I have done differently? to win that case. Why, what did I do wrong? But we lost it nine to zero, John. Um, and so that's comforting in the sense that you really know that there was very little that you could have done. Uh, our Chief Justice, John Roberts, uh, who argued 39 cases in the Supreme Court before he became Chief Justice, uh, once lost a case nine to nothing. And people came to him and said, how could you lose that case nine to nothing and he responded that because there were only nine justices. Um, and so that's my excuse for having lost at nine to nothing. I probably would have been 13 to nothing if there had been 13 justices. Yeah, sure. You never stood a chance, I guess. Um, I want to go back to the uh, DACA case, Ted, um, uh, because I, I read an article that I, I, I was totally unaware uh, that this happened. Um, uh, but... Uh, when you argued the case before the Supreme Court, you had someone, uh, I'm not sure what the lawyer's term of art is for it, but your seat mate or someone in your right seat, uh, there's a story about um, who stood with you uh, in arguing that, that uh, case. Could you tell us that story? I'm glad that you asked that question, John, because it's a very moving story and it means a lot to me. Uh, and we think it meant a lot to the case, however um, symbolic it was and however many people knew about it or not. Uh, one of the individuals that we, one of the 700,000 individuals that we were representing uh, was a person who had been brought to this country at a very, very young age. He studied, he worked hard, he managed to get himself through college. He went to college, I think, in Idaho. Uh, he managed to get in, be permitted, um, even though he was an undocumented alien in this country, he managed to get admitted to a law school in the state of Washington. Um, he couldn't afford his law books, uh, so he borrowed them from a friend. Uh, and, and when his friend was done late at night using the law books, uh, Luis would get up, would stay up and study those law books all night long so he could return those law books to his friend at the end of the morning. He studied hard, he worked hard, he graduated from law school, and then he took the bar exam and he passed the bar exam, the same sort of thing, borrowing materials. And he had been in, admitted to practice in the state of Washington for a few years by the time this case came to us. Uh, and he was one of the lawyers who helped us bring the case to us. And we arranged for him to be admitted 
to the Supreme Court bar. When you uh, want to practice before the Supreme Court, you have to file an application. You have to be in good standing in a state bar. You have to have been practicing for a certain period of time. He met all of those qualifications. So a few weeks before the argument in the Supreme Court, he was admitted to practice before the Supreme Court. And then when we went in to argue the DACA case, he, we put, uh, there's a table there with a, with a couple of lawyers, the lawyer who's going to do the argument and, and uh, his assistants. Uh, and we put Luis next to me at the council table in the United States Supreme Court. So that was sending a message to all of the dreamers out there that here is someone who could become a member of the Supreme Court bar, be a part of the team arguing his case, and it was a message to the justices. Um, and we didn't say anything about it. You don't do that in the Supreme Court, but we assume that the clerk advised the justices as to what was going on. It was a symbol to the justices that here was an individual who wanted to be a part of this country, who wanted to be an American, who had worked hard to get to that point. And here he was in the United States Supreme Court when his case was being argued and he was a participant uh, and he helped out. Um, so that's the answer to your question. It's a, it's a very moving thing that took place um, and um, the, the citizens or the, the persons that we represented, the dreamers, understood what was going on there. They very much appreciated that gesture. Yeah, well, kudos to you, Ted, for uh, and not just being able to tell quite a story, but, uh, you know, for making that dream happen and making that a reality for that young attorney. And uh, so uh, this, it's the kind of story Ronald Reagan would tell. And, and you know, it's the kind of thing Ronald Reagan, I think, would do as well. So thanks for for bringing us into the inner circle on that, Ted. And I think that Ronald, yes, I think that you're absolutely right. That's what Ronald Reagan would have done. Um, uh, and what Ronald Reagan would also have done is uh, he would have said, that wasn't me, that was our team that made that recommendation. Um, it was a group of individuals that get the credit for making those judgments and making that happen. Uh, that's what Ronald Reagan would have said, and that's what I have to say. It was a it was a team effort, but it was something that was sort of inspired, uh, and it is exactly the sort of story that Ronald Reagan would tell uh, to bring tears to the eyes of people and to illustrate a principle that he believed in. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Ted, to go back to the Prop Eight case um, that, you, as you said, you spent five years on. Uh, I know a, a number of um, conservatives or those in the Republican Party might say, gosh, you know, Ted, what's hap happened to your conservative flair? You know, this is not the kind of thing that uh, conservatives uh, would necessarily support. Yet you argued before the court um, the fact that the, this Prop 8 was a violation of a couple of maybe two, three or more very fundamental principles uh, to the Constitution. Can you just briefly um, take a conservative through uh, your rationale as to why the property was unconstitutional? I'd be happy to do that. In fact, I wrote at the time, uh, we started, the, the Proposition 8 was passed by the citizens of California in November of 2008. Um, we started the case in 2009. We started the actual trial uh, with witnesses and so forth in January of 2010. I wrote an article that was a cover story uh, for uh, Newsweek magazine, um, a quite a lengthy piece called the conservative, and it was on the cover of Newsweek magazine, it's called the, uh, the conservative case for gay marriage to try to explain why I felt that this was a principle that conservatives should have su been supporting and would support. Um, and one of the, so among the points that I made was that here are loving individuals, people who want to be a part of, make a permanent commitment uh, to one another, to create a family, to create a relationship 
um, not a casual relationship, but a family relationship, to raise children, to be a part of our community, to live in our neighborhoods, to, to be our bookseller or our dentist or our doctor or our lawyer. Um, they want, they, these individuals want to be a part of our community, want to be a part of our life. What is more conservative than that? To include individuals who are law abiding, who want to be a part of society and form a commitment to one another and to the people around them, uh, and to be a part of our society and the way that we live in this country. Um, many years before, the United States Supreme Court had held unconstitutional uh, laws that existed in over 16 states, I can't remember the exact number, that prohibited persons uh, to marry someone of a different race. Now, when I explained that to people, people said, well, you mean that was really true in this country, that President Obama, um, his parents could not have been married um, uh, when he was conceived and born. Uh, but it was true. Uh, and the United States Supreme Court, in a case called Loving versus Virginia, overturned and, and unanimously as unconstitutional that prohibition on marrying the person that you loved simply because they were Asian or African American or Hispanic uh, and vice versa. If you were Asian or African American or Hispanic or American, Native American, you wouldn't be permitted to marry someone who was outside that particular racial category. Uh, and the Supreme Court rejected that. I thought there was a lot in that case that was similar to what we were talking about here. And we kept asking the other side in court, uh, we did this in briefs and in arguments in the court, what harm to marriage can be done by allowing these two men who we were representing or these two women that we were representing, what harm can it do to California to uh, marry people in California? What harm can it do to other families if these individuals who are allowed to form a bond and live a, as a part of our community. Uh, and we now know that no harm came from that, that what, what many people opposed at the time we started this case, they now support really without thinking. And young people, if you ask young people, over 90% of young people would say, what is that all about? Why would we want to harm them? Why would we want to perpetuate in our constitution discrimination against individuals. It tells everybody that they are less valuable or their relationships are less valuable than our relationships. And so I'm very proud of the outcome of that case. And I'm very proud to say as a conservative that many, many, many conservatives now uh, agree with that proposition. And it is better for this country that this form of discrimination no longer is embodied in our laws or our constitution. Yeah, you know, in listening to you, Ted, and having uh, re read some of your uh, opinion pieces in the past, um, I wonder. It seems to me one of the hallmarks of your legal career is it's really a um, protection of uh, the freedoms that individuals in this country should enjoy. And so I know there's zero relationship between the Prop 8 case that you just noted and, uh, for example, the Citizens United case where it was a, uh, essentially a free speech issue. But it's, would it be fair to say that a lot of uh, your career has been spent trying to protect individual freedoms, regardless of which right in the Constitution uh, it represents? I think that's a fair statement, John, and I'm glad you put it that way. I think that that is true. Citizens United uh, involved whether individuals forming themselves together as a corporation uh, could express views about election issues. Uh, and our First Amendment protects the maximum amount of freedom and liberty to express ideas. The Supreme Court said that we all benefit by a robust expression of points of view. That's one of the things that's somewhat at peril today because if you say certain things that are unpopular, people will uh, shame you or cancel you or close, uh, close down, protest your ability to speak at a university or a college or something like that because of a, of a point of view that other people disagree with. Our First Amendment 
exalts the maximum amount of robust freedom, even if it's even if it's disappointing, even if it's um, unpleasant speech. Um, there's all kinds of cases all throughout our history. So the Citizens United case, uh, we were representing a small ideological corporation on the right side of the political spectrum, and they wanted to produce a 90-minute documentary uh, that explained why they thought that Hillary Clinton was not qualified to be president of the United States. And they had received a small amount of their financing from a corporation. And because of that, the law would have exposed them to a prison sentence of five years in prison for that 90-minute documentary. And we argued, well, what could be more central to the freedom uh, expressed in the First Amendment than to explain to people why someone should be qualified or should not be qualified to be president of the United States. Those are the views that we want our citizens to have so that our citizens can decide who's right and who's wrong. If you only hear one side of things, that's a terrible thing. That's not what the First Amendment's all about. That's not what our democracy is all about. And that's not what America is all about. So yes, that was a similar case and in many of the cases, when I have an opportunity to take a case, it does affect me um, when I think about, is it, is it consistent with our principles? Uh, and I think of Ronald Reagan a lot. You know, I've talked to Mrs. Reagan um, about the Proposition 8 case. We had lunch in which I talked about it with her at great length. And I said, we, I was not going to ask her to put herself in the political fray because she is not comfortable doing that sort of thing. But I said, how do you how do you feel about it? And how would Ronald Reagan have felt about it? And she said, there was no doubt that he would be on your side because of the his respect uh, for individuals and people he had known throughout his professional career in Hollywood and other places where he knew people who were um, in the LGBT category. That's not what we called it those days. But um, it is individual freedom. It is individual liberty. And that's, I think, a great deal of what conservatives are all about. Now, I have had people say that they've disagreed with me. Um, and some conservatives have disagreed with me. But I think that most conservatives will say, well, yes, I disagree with you, but um, it's a good thing in a way that people advocate for individual freedom. Um, and um, it, I may not agree with you, but I respect your right to be able to say it. Um, and I feel the same way about other views. Yeah, well put, Ted. Uh, let's briefly talk about uh, another type of freedom, the uh, freedom to maintain uh, one's privacy if they so choose. Now, I know the uh, Apple computers uh, case um, that you were very involved in, uh, the government decided not to go all the way to the Supreme Court. But the, here was a case where I wonder if you, in any respect, felt torn um, because of uh, the, certainly your, as you said, you, know, you, the, you want to maintain or advance a, uh, any citizen's right to maintain their privacy, while at the same time the, that right was juxtaposed against the, presumably the nation's ability to uh, defend itself. And uh, uh, so I wonder, um, was that something that gnawed at you? Or no, this was straightforward. The, the absolute right to privacy uh, should stand, uh, re regardless of the ramifications for making it potentially more difficult to track down terrorists and that sort of thing. Maybe you could speak to that. Yes, I, and, and that is also a very good question, John, because these things are often competing values. The government wanted Apple to assist the government in unlocking a cell phone that a terrorist had owned or possessed. Uh, it was owned by San Bernardino County, in fact, but it was a possessed by the terrorist who'd done um, some vile act, killed lots of people. Uh, and the government wanted to unlock that cell phone but it felt it wasn't able to do it. It turned out it, it found out a way to do it without Apple's help. But Apple took the position, uh, and I hope I'm expressing this accurately, uh, that we have, we have an, encrypted those cell phones to protect individual privacy and individual liberty. 
so that the government cannot come along, some judge cannot come along, some government can come along. It could have been a district attorney in San Bernardino it, or Al Albany, New York, or Peoria, Illinois, or something like that, that wanted us to help them to unlock the cell phone. In the first place, they said, you can't conscript our engineers to work for you. You can't make us design a device that we didn't design. We created that device to protect people's privacy. And remember, it is not just the FBI that wanted that, that, that cell phone unlocked, but it could, and we turned out there were 60 or 70 other applications to do the same thing by law enforcement agencies all across the country. And the other thing is that Apple made the point that hundreds of millions of people throughout the world trust us when we say that we've done our best to protect your personal information. Uh, and it's terrible if that personal information belongs to a terrorist. But there are hundreds of millions of people who are not terrorists that have privacy. Think of, think of a government such as China or think of a government in the Middle East. Uh, think of a government that prosecutes or persecutes pe gay people. Uh, or that pr prosecutes or persecutes people who have a different view of the government, uh, that are dissidents in Malaysia or someplace like that. I'm just making these examples up. Those people have depended upon our promise, and we can't help break that promise because they can be put in jail. They can be murdered. They can be tortured if, if that cell phone is unblocked. And if we unblock it for you, uh, that is going to leak out. And that, that and so we felt very, very strongly that, and Apple had done everything they possibly could to help the government uh, with the information that was available to them to deal with this terrorist threat uh, and in every other case. But they felt that one step that they could not take was to uh, put their engineers to work to develop a device that would make this cell phone that they had marketed as an effective uh, protector of privacy into a defective protector of privacy. They weren't going to invent a bad cell phone. Got it, got it. Um, I know, uh, I have no law degree, uh, Ted, but I know enough about uh, the law school experience to where they every lawyer is classically trained to be able to take um, and study um, the other side's argument, but be able to take either side of an argument. That's a real skill. And um, But I, I wonder, um, especially for the cases that you've uh, taken all with the Supreme Court, is it a real advantage, or in fact, do you in, insist uh, at the outset that you are in, in agreement with the plaintiff's case, that you know, you, there's something fundamental that you believe is at stake and that you agree with in order to take that case? Or, no, it's just as easy to argue the other side, whether you've got a passion for that particular point of view or not. Well, we think of ourselves as advocates. Uh, and when you are asking someone uh, in a court of law to represent your point of view, um, it seems that you're not asking for someone to agree with you. You're asking for someone to put your case before the judges, to get give the judges the best arguments to, on your side of the case. So I don't insist that I agree with everything that my clients have to say, but I insist that I am able to understand it, that these are respectable arguments, these are not frivolous arguments, and there are certain people I wouldn't work for. I wouldn't work for organized crime, I wouldn't work for uh, a drug cartel, I wouldn't work for individuals that had uh, been guilty of uh, misconduct with respect to minors or things like that. On the other hand, uh, it is important to understand both sides of an argument. I was a debater in college. Uh, I was on the forensics team, and we went to 15 uh, to 20 tournaments a year, uh, and we would argue the proposition that was set for the intercollegiate debate year. Uh, and at, at 9 o'clock, you'd argue the affirmative, and at 11 o'clock, you'd argue the negative, and then affirmative and negative, and so on and so forth. So, so we were being judged on our ability to express persuasively coherent arguments on either side. Now, that training 
is extremely valuable for a lawyer. You've got to be able to understand the best arguments on the other side if you're going to make the best arguments for your side of the case. Every time I argue a case in court, and I have one next week in the federal court in San Francisco, and tomorrow we're going to do something called a moot court, where m members of my team will ask me very, very hard questions. They will try to penetrate the arguments that I'm prepared to make to the judge so that I will see and hear and understand what the other side might say. If you can't understand what the other side might say, if you can't, in a sense, actually make that argument and then figure out what is the res best response to it, um, in, most, in most situations in today's world, there are more than, there's more than one side to every story. Um, and that's why the people we have debates, why we have democracy and so forth. And in order to, in order to, is, in, in, as a matter of government, uh, if you're going to be a member of a legislative body or, or, an, or if you're a governor or a mayor, in order to understand and help the people that you represent, you've got to understand that there are different points of view. And you've got to be able to find a way to compromise to get, maybe there are different, different parts of an issue where you can agree and get something done. But as an advocate, I think that my clients expect me to make the best arguments um, uh, that I can for them. And for me not to say, well, I wouldn't agree with the same outcome and therefore I can't represent you or I'm going to represent you in a weakened capacity. I can't do that. I try to do the best I can so that the, ju and the justices, I've talked to justices on the Supreme Court and they've told me, Ted, what we expect from you is the best argument so that I can, we can hear the best argument on your side and the best argument on the other side, and then we can decide the cases. Now, part of our job is to present our arguments on a particular side as so persuasive um, and um, on, on failing that the court will agree with us. But you have to understand the other side and you have to appreciate the sense of the other side as well. Well said, Ted. Um, let's talk about briefly about uh, the nomination confirmation process of uh, justices for the Supreme Court. I, I wonder, and I, I know uh, the recent um, uh, confirmation process for Brett Kavanaugh was, um, you know, hugely, hugely. Uh, difficult to, for both sides. Uh, and I know it goes back to Bork, and I'm sure even prior to that, but is, do you think our nation, have we lost our way in terms of um, an appropriate uh, confirmation process for Supreme Court justices? It just seems to me, if you take something like the Kavanaugh case, that it's just gotten out of hand. W would you agree? And it, I and do it agree. And I'm... Be, uh, if you've got any ideas with respect to how the process can be improved so that we can do this more rationally, I'd love to hear that too. Well, I wish I did have a, a, an answer to the question because I do agree with you that it has become terrible. Uh, and I was a very, very close friend of Judge Bork, and I was very saddened for this country and for him, what happened to him. He was a man of great dignity, uh, integrity, and intellect, uh, and he was a very decent individual. Uh, and he was uh, terrorized um, when he came up for the confirmation. And the same thing happened to Clarence Thomas, who was another dear friend and a very kind, very capable individual. And it has become that way. I did a calculation of the Senate votes for justices. Uh, Justice Scalia was confirmed unanimously. Justice O'Connor and Justice Kennedy conf were confirmed unanimously. Um, there were only three votes, I think, against Justice Ginsburg uh, and nine against Justice Breyer, who were appointed by President uh, Clinton. Uh, and now, in the later years, in the most recent years, there have been 35, 39, 47, uh, and 48 votes against um, Judge Kavanaugh to be on the Supreme Court. And I, I have to admit a bias. I testified in favor of Justice Kavanaugh, um, and I had worked on the confirmation process for Chief Justice Roberts, who is a, someone I also know. I, these And the individuals, Justice Kagan and Sotomayor, 
who were appointed by uh, President Obama are extraordinarily well-qualified people. Same is true of Justice Gorsuch, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Alito, Chief Justice Roberts, who are the most recent six appointees. The fact that more than a third and almost, almost half of the United States Senate will vote against them, even though these individuals went to the finest law schools, uh, were clerked on the Supreme Court in many cases, served as federal appellate judges who had um, unblemished records, who are persons of the greatest character. Those are the persons we want on the United States Supreme Court. And that's why I mentioned persons appointed by Justice Obama as well as President Trump. I mean, President Obama and President Trump. Um, these are the kind of individuals that we would want to be our leaders in our nation's highest court. And then when we savage them in the process and we tell the American people that nearly half the United States Senate believes that they're not qualified or that they're not good people, uh, that is, makes it very difficult when they become a part of the United States Supreme Court for the credibility of the court, the dignity of the court. We've politicized it so badly, it's so polarized uh, and it's so divisive that it's an excruciating process for these individuals to go through, and I mean that both sides of the political aisle. That needs to stop. How it will stop, I don't know, because it has become like um, the Middle East. You know, I mean, there's the the um, Israelis and the Palestinians. You, there's always revenge for the last bad act by the other side. Um, and so the Republicans will keep doing it, and the Democrats will keep doing it to Republican appointees and so forth. Um, and, and, the, and the American people don't like it. They don't like what they're seeing. They know that these people, if they think about it, are well-qualified, decent individuals, and they hate to see what's happening to them. Uh, and it's bad for the court. It's bad for the country. Um, the, now, someone's going to have to shake things up in the United States Senate and tell the representatives, you know, give these individuals the respect that they're due. Understand that they are going to be holding uh, the highest, among the highest positions in our land. Have them make arguments about whether their principles or their background is sufficiently strong, but don't destroy their character. Um, and that's, that's very sad that that's happened. I hope it will stop, but I'm not too sanguine about that. Got it. Good. Thank you, Ted. Just a, a couple more questions instead. I'm going to shift gears here. This is a, a, a very contemporary issue, and I, I, you might have even be involved in some legal matter related to it, uh, uh, and that's the New York State's uh, recent uh, passage of uh, the bail reform. And, you know, uh, an argument's being made now that so much more of the increase that we see in violence um, across the country, but at New York State as well, um, uh, is uh, specifically because of this provision uh, that the judiciary there is living by, which is, you know, no bail. You know, nobody has to pay bail, see in court. Um, and there's a concern that, that we're getting a lot more crime as a result. Do you connect the two? Do you think there's an issue there, there that has to be dealt with? I do, John, and I think it's a little bit um, akin to the so-called defund the police uh, movement. Uh, a part of the preamble to our Constitution is uh, says to preserve liberty and to preserve order and to preserve justice. Uh, it is a constitutional right to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When individuals take a life or take away someone's liberty or take away their property or invade their homes, we have to do something about that or we're not delivering to the American people what we're promising in the preamble to the Constitution, the very basis of our life. We have to have order. We have to have uh, discipline in, in our lives. That's why we have laws that are passed by our Congress, and our legislatures, um, and they protect individuals' freedom to be as free as possible and to have as much liberty as possible. When you, have when you don't have a police department to uphold those laws, to respond when your house is being invaded, 
or, or when 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 a husband is abusing a spouse or something like that, when you don't have police to do that, you're losing that very, very fundamental element of ordered society. And when you take individuals who have a proclivity, uh, and they have had g examples in New York of people that have committed dozens of crimes of being turned out on on uh, turned into society to perform an, one more crime. Every time there's a crime like that, uh, it's if if ever t if a rapist is turned loose, if if a if someone who uh, robs you on the street is turned loose or rakes into your home is turned loose, and they do that again, that's a strike at your fundamental freedom. I felt the same way, uh, and you mentioned Barbara before. Uh, my wife was taken; her life was taken in a terrorist act. We have a life. If if a, a fundamental freedom in this country is individual, the, our right to life. Um, and to take away a person's life, we have to do something about individuals that have shown a propensity to continue to commit crimes against our society and against our fellow citizens. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Okay, last question. Um, a brilliant, you've had a brilliant legal career. Um, just amazing, actually. And I, I wonder, uh, Ted, had you not gone to law school, had you not taken the path and, um, you know, taken such a remarkable leadership position in our judicial system as you have, what would you have done? Is there um, another career that, uh, you know, you'd say, I, sh I really could have done well here or there? I just wonder if there's a, another Ted Olson underneath it all that, uh, would just as soon be happy doing X. Is there something else out there like that? Well, that's a tough question because I wanted to be a lawyer for as far back as I can remember. I thought about it in college when I was on the debate team and, and um, studying the art of persuasion. Uh, and I loved law school from the very first day. And I've loved the, my law practice and the law firm that I practice with, Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, uh, my whole life. I can't imagine what it would have been like um, and I haven't thought very much about the alternative. Thank goodness I didn't have to. But I was editor of the newspaper in college also. I wrote a column, and I, would, I wrote a lot of different things. I guess my answer would be I would have wanted to have been a writer. I would have wanted to put my ideas out there because there are different ways to try to persuade people. If you have thoughts in your head or ideas or your analysis of something, you can pursue that as a lawyer on behalf of clients. But if you're successful, and I don't know whether I could have been or not, uh, as a writer, uh, as a journalist or an essayist or um, a, a, a person who wrote books that people might want to read, um, I would have wanted, I guess I would have turned to that if they said, you can't practice law. I would have tried to do something. I think not just because of the challenge of doing it well, but the intellectual um, uh, gratification of trying to express oneself uh, and to get across a point of view, to see how other people react to it. Uh, people might say, well, that's stupid, you know, and that's what you do when you're in college, by the way. I wrote a lot of things that were really stupid. But um, that's, that's part of the process. You learn from doing those things and letting other people um, uh, uh, take a look at what you what's come out of your head and pointed out the flaws in it. Well, that's a part of the process. So I suppose I might have tried to go in that direction. I don't know. I could have been, and um, as far as I know, a miserable failure uh, at that. But I would have maybe tried. <laughs> Great. Well, that's another noble profession. So, um, Ted, we again we can't thank you enough for your time. It's just been. A pleasure spending the last hour with you, and uh, um, the very only the very best of luck in, uh, to you in uh, your future legal battles. And uh, please give our best to, to your lovely wife, uh, Lady Booth. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for everything that you do and all of your team. I know that you are a part of a sensational team of people. I mentioned the board of directors, but the staff that works for you with you at the Reagan Foundation. Uh, they're all such wonderful people, and all I can say is it is such a thrill 
to visit the library and the foundation. My wife and I, as you know, were, at, at, were your guests last year, and I serve on the board. So I, I, I'm so thrilled at walking through the facility and hearing stories about Ronald Reagan. Watch what he wrote. Listen to excerpts of his speeches uh, and just touch the things that he touched uh, is an extraordinary experience. And you and the other members of the foundation are so good at keeping that memory alive and bringing things um, to, to the fore, explorations of his life and people, things that he was interested in. Um, and I'm very grateful to be a part of that. Great. Thank you so much, Ted. Uh, please take care of yourself. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Joan. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.